is there is there some, something you could call sort of a ghost chord where you hear the chord and you actually your ear kind of fills in a note that maybe isn't there? Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, that's what I can demonstrate that right now for you. Okay. Okay. Um, if I play power chords, which are just a root and a fifth, they're neither major nor minor. Right. Power chords are ghost chords. They are, okay. Right? Uh, let me see. If I go... No, that's not a good one. I want to maybe... I'm tempted to make up a chord progression because I can't think of a ready example. Okay. Now, I have an A5 power chord, a C5 power chord, an F5 power chord, and a G5 power chord, right? Okay. Now, I will grant you this much. The first chord can either be major or minor. That, that I'll grant you that much. Like, our ear can fill in either one. So, um, but before I go on, I will say this. The rest of the array of chords are implied majors, not minor. Okay. And I could prove it by adding those, the major or minor notes. So let's, uh, let's assume this first chord is A minor. Okay. Now when we do the C power chord, it's implying a major chord. Okay. When we do the G chord, it's implying a major chord. And when we do the F chord, it's implying a major chord. Now if I play that entire progression, it'll sound perfectly fine. Not a problem anywhere there. Okay. Now, the ear, remember we're talking about what the ear fills in from the, these chords, mm -hmm. right? We, our ear is not hearing this, is not filling this in. Oh, yeah. That's, that's minor chords yeah. right there, okay? Yeah. There's not a single one of these chords down here that you could make minor and will sound good. I'll just make the C minor for a second. It's kind of a muddy motion now. It's bad, bad chord writing. Yeah. Right? So we'll keep the C major. Let's make the F minor. The F minor may work, but, but that could work a little bit. Yeah, maybe. In a way, it could work, the F minor, but our ear still fills in major. You know what this said uh, when you were earlier, when you were playing the, the rudiments of this thing you were demonstrating? <clears throat> Sounded like an old uh, Cars number. Could be. Do you know the chorus one? I don't know the name of the song. Something like that. I'll think of it for next time. Yeah, and who knows, maybe we could, the band could roast it. Get <laughs> cars to him. So the answer, that is the demonstration answer to your question, that yes, there are chords that the ear fills in the rest, especially if you leave out the thirds. Yeah, okay. No, no, no. Sometimes that, yeah, that's my ear does. Before I forget it, Joe Jackson for our Venice Roasters. Think of... Oh, yeah, Joe. Yeah, I, yeah. We actually messed around with... Uh, um, <laughs> oh, by the way, I did my singing debut with the last show, too. There we are. Yeah, I did A Whole lot of Love. Okay. I uh, into Life in the Fast Lane, into uh, The Wind Cries Mary, all roasted. Oh, good. Good for you. You little dog. Yeah, well, I can <laughs> sing in that low register so I can get away with it, you know. <laughs> anyway, all right, now... What this all was leading to was, um, we kind of established here that we're really, what we're doing is we're playing a minor triad with some, with a bow tie on it, all right? Okay. So this is really, we're going to conclude that the implication of that first chord is minor. And I know it sounds a little bit plain vanilla like that, yeah. but if you choose the other options, like sharp nine, like seventh, it's not fully blues. Right. And if we choose major, we have the same problem. That's not it. Okay. This is the closest we could come. When we add the bow tie and the top hat, 
it becomes really nice. Yeah. And very jazzy. Yeah. All right. No kidding. Uh, and that's why uh, that's because Billy Preston himself was a was a keyboardist, a proper keyboardist, a proper piano player. So he he could play those jazz chords. Did he have a little attitude on this stuff? Uh, when he was playing, or you know, did Martin dictate what he played? I, I think he had latitude. Yeah. Um, he it was probably like you know like any group venture. Yeah. You know, like the with collaboration. Band, you know, hey, you know what? I'm here in this. Okay. The bass player in my band, we call I I gave him the nickname Nixon. Okay. Because whenever I throw out an idea to him, with all of my damn musical brilliance, he'll mm. go, he'll go, uh, he'll go, nah, and he nixes it. So uh. we call him Nixon. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, getting back to the point, we, we've established, I think we can establish that this is a form of a D minor, mm -hmm. right? Now, if we're in the key of D minor, that's relative to F major. That's the relative minor of the key of F major. However, when we do the come together part, that's got nothing to do with F major at all. So what it has to do with is D major. But he's going. So we have our A and our G. And and then we go back to our minor. So what this is is a juxtaposition of parallel major, parallel minor situation. Parallel major, minor meaning that within the context of one key center you're you're keeping the same root D and you're treating the chords either as if they're D minor in one section and D major in another okay now this this D minor to A to G this can constitute now this is really deep stuff here but this this chord progression actually can exist within a key okay if you were to look at the chord family template First of all, there's no such thing as, this is a G7, that's an A7. I'm, I haven't really, let me outline the chords for the song. Um, so we have D minor. Now we have A7. G7. And then we have our bridge, our chorus, B minor. A, G, A, and that's it, okay? So now, G7, A7, you would think to yourself, wait a second, I said, I said a long time ago, Vinny said a long time ago, mm -hmm. that every key has its own unique dominant seventh, meaning that there can only be one dominant seventh per key, and it's a unique dominant seventh. Mm -hmm. This is what I call first level or pure music theory. This is a theory that works within one key structure, and doesn't allow for other um, chords from other keys to come in. Second level, second tier music theory allows for those chords to come in. Okay. When we get there, and I always say this, you know, 90% of all music theory is true, and 10% is left over to make it untrue. Okay. All right? Um, in first level theory, there is no such thing as a key that can contain a D minor, a G7, and an A7. Uh -huh. All right? Okay. But when the melodic minor scale is built, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, maybe one day, but right now, when you build the melodic minor scale and then you create chords out of it, you find out that the four chord has a G7 and the five chord has an A7. Okay. So this could actually be a, a full key. Okay. Right? Even though it seems impossible in first level, it's possible in second level. All right. All right. So, um... Especially when you see two seventh chords a whole step apart like that, mm -hmm. what I do is I play, when well, I improvise a melodic minor scale. Alright? Mm -hmm. Because, why? Because those three chords fit in the key structure of D melodic minor. But, we're, we're, by doing this, we're outlining a minor situation. You know, this could be a Latin song. So, and that, that sits perfectly well. But then when we go to, there's something that feels way different there. Yeah. And that's because we're changing this, the key center from minor to major. Okay. And now the key of D has, 
as 4 and 5 G and A major, not 7th, but major. Maybe maybe 7th on the 5 chord, which is... It basically, it's 6, 4, 5 of D. The 6 chord, the 4 chord, and the 5 chord. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and that's pretty much it for the song. I'd like to go move over to the solo if we have a minute. Uh, I forget what that is there. I was working it out before. That's it. Okay. And if you listen, there's a lower harmony. And actually, he eliminates the last note, but. So what this, this is harmonized at fourths. So if I were to play the two harmonies together, I can't really bend, but it'd be more like... Mm -hmm. Like that. Fourths again. Okay, and Billy yeah. Preston is doing fourths. Maybe this was a fortuitous accident, but there's a lot of chordal a harmony fourth here. fortuitous accident, yeah. All right. And sorry about that screw-up before. I, oh, I that's actually all right. had worked it out. Um... Now, McCartney's contribution to this, like before, you know, earlier, it seemed like he was kind of shrugging off a lot of what Lennon was doing, but McCartney put a lot, if you listen to Abbey Road, it's all about the bass, like the bass mm -hmm. is just incredible, all the way through the record, which you'll also hear is a lot of Beach Boys influence. Oh, okay. Um, but McCartney really, really worked this out. He really, really, um, you know, put his juice into it and said, I'm going to do the old Paul McCartney bass that I did on Peppers, that really mm -hmm. kind of melodic, out front bass sound. Morning, and there's another thing. The harmonies are chordal. Oh, okay. The, the vocal harmonies. So you have chordal harmony in the Billy Preston's thing. You have chordal harmony. I can't get yeah. both strings, but... You know, and then you have chordal harmony in the vocals. Mm -hmm. The only person who could have who could have sketched all these ideas out would be George Martin. Yeah, the Beatles could not possibly think in those ways. They just didn't have it. Has he written any other stuff down? George Martin. Yeah, he's done a lot of work. Has, I mean, has he talked specifically about these? Yeah, you can. Um, there's some beautiful. Actually, in the Beatles anthology, there's a lot of uh, stuff with him sitting at the at the board. Yeah. Like, oh, now if you listen to this John's version of this song, listen to the the haunting quality of his vocal in this particular song. Huh. It was a day in a life he was demonstrating that. But yeah, I once heard a radio interview that just kicked butt. It was just about George Martin talking about how Strawberry Fields was made, and my God. Can you find it on <coughs> on, the on Google YouTube? or whatever? Probably on YouTube. Yeah. Because what they do is they YouTube they people rip clips from big movies yeah and, you know so um, well we covered it today we covered come together come together awesome. and, and, and this week, is, is this it was this first one on the album uh, yes the first song on the album okay of Abbey Road of Abbey Road the, and you know I wish it had been released last because it would have been the crowning yeah, glory of pinnacle the sort of yeah. I think Beatles threw out Let It Be just to say, well, let's give them this, you know, they still love us, so let's make this record, you know. Now, what comes next in this album? Something. Oh, there we go. And George Harrison, by the way, just real quick, really came into his own by this point. Like, he wrote two classic, classic pop songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't look at the song list, but there's, there might be even a third George Harrison song on there. But Here Comes the Sun and Something. Yeah. I mean, when you hang out with people with a guitar and mention the Beatles, you'll hear those people say, oh, play Here Comes the Sun. Yeah, there you go. You know. <laughs> sure. So, well, we will we will take on uh, the rest of this album starting a couple weeks. It's going to be fun, yeah. All right. Goodbye, Vinny. Ciao.